Hello and welcome back to our bookshop intring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview. We're talking to debut novelist Matson Taylor. He's written The Miseducation of Evie Epworth. Uh, Evie is a teenage girl growing up in Yorkshire with uh, the archetypal uh, evil stepmother. But um, it's a classic story and uh, a classic character. Uh, like discovering Adrian Mole or Bridget Jones for the first time is the credit on the front. And that's very true. So I do hope you enjoy the interview. Uh, Matson is talking to Leanne Coombs. Ben. Thank you, Ben. Um, hi, Matson. Hi, how Leanne. Are Hello. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, it's a very, very hot day down here in London at the moment. Yes. Yeah, it's very warm, isn't it? <laughs> So you've got your windows open though? Well, no, I've, I haven't got my windows open because I don't want it to be too noisy. So okay. I'm, I'm sat here in a sauna. I've got a very okay. light flat with lots of windows, which is normally fantastic, but not when you're doing a Zoom recording, yeah. <laughs> Same actually, yeah. I've closed my little sunroof in. Ah, very nice. Um, yeah, so congratulations on your, on your debut. Um, got a copy here, obviously, The Miseducation of Evie Epworth. Very nice. Um, me too. Yeah, I loved it. It's okay. very, very good. Mine's bigger than yours, I think. Yours is bigger than mine. If I bring it closer, though. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah. So if we start off, you just can tell us a little bit about it. What can readers expect? Okay. It's well. It's uh, it's a coming of age story. It's a coming of age story for a girl, Evie, Evie Epworth. And it's also the coming of age story for a decade, for the 1960s. And I just thought it'd be quite interesting to bring these two things together. Um, in my day job, I'm a, I'm a historian. And we often talk about decades, so the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Um, and um, a lot of these decades, they don't really get going until a few years after the decade begins. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to try and pinpoint that time, that precise moment when the 60s really became the 60s, what we understand culturally as the 60s. Um, and so I've tried to bring that into the book where you, you get the, the 60s becoming the 60s. And, and kind of as parallel, there's also this idea of a, a young 16 and a half year old girl um, it's that funny age between being a child, being an adult, and you know, one, one, one moment you're really young and naive, one moment you're really knowing and clever and probably know far more than most of the adults around you. And I wanted to try and pinpoint that moment as well. So it's very much those two moments, both individually and for the decade, the growing up, yeah. Yeah, I definitely got that with Evie. She's 16 and a half, isn't she, in the, in the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a kind of worries and about what kind of woman she's going to grow into, um, and yeah, who does she want to be? Um, and I guess like I wondered how easy it was for you to get into that headspace of like being a teenager, or did you kind of do any research? Did you speak to anybody or? Well, I mean, of course, it was only a couple of years ago since I was a teenager myself. <laughs> very. <laughs> Um, um, I don't know, it was, it was quite easy actually, yeah, I just look back, I remember that age quite clearly in my own mind and thinking, oh my god, I've got the rest of this infinity of time stretching out ahead of me, this universe of opportunities. And, and it's kind of thinking, well, well, what do I do? What shall I do? And it's, it's almost like when you're in one of those massive supermarkets and you need to get I don't know, like some olive oil and there's 50 different brands of olive oil and you're like, oh God, God which one shall I get? And it, there's just too much choice. And in a way being 16, it's a bit like that because you, you can just literally almost do anything. And, and I suppose like the older you get, the, the, those choices fall away a little bit. But I wanted to capture that moment where you're just um, absolutely exploding with energy and ideas and enthusiasm. And you just think, yeah, the world's yours. What shall you do? And, and I think it was, it was <laughs> relatively easy for a you know, grumpy middle-aged Yorkshireman to go back in my own mind and, and try and relive that, that time of being 16, 16 and a half. Yeah. I enjoyed it, actually. It was a nice thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. You get that, like, she's very likeable as she is, but she does seem to grow so much throughout. And all the kind of information that she, that she gets as, she, as the story progresses as well. Um, I was going to say about the, the female characters, like some of them are really like you, you love them like instantly and some of them are not even likeable. <laughs> and I wondered like how, how you came up with them because some of them seem quite 
not like a but like larger like larger than life like they're like really kind of um exaggerated i guess in, in some instances um and i wondered what if there was any kind of inspirations behind them or yeah just how you kind of created them um i think i mean i, I suppose i mean i grew up so it's a bit of a cliche but i mean i i think in in yorkshire there is this stereotype of the strong woman and you know lots of strong women and and i did grow up surrounded by lots of aunts and, and sort of neighbors and strong women and um, I think that stayed with me. And, and I, I had a very strange conversation actually with someone last week and we were talking about bosses and I suddenly realized I've never had a male boss. And like all my bosses have always been women. So I suppose I'm just, I've always been used to these um, strong, independently minded, um, you know, energetic women. And um, I, I think there's a lot of, of those different people who I've met in the book. Um, and also in the book, I think the book is a bit of a, a modern fairy tale, if you like. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm glad that there are some goodies, if you like, and people who you instantly warm to. And I really wanted there to be some baddies as well, who you kind of just want to boo every time they come onto the stage. And, and, and I kind of really enjoyed writing those characters as well. They, they were really good fun to write. They, they were all really good fun to write. But I think it was kind of part based on and kind of a, uh, a, a a huge number of real people drawing little bits from people and then part just taking that and my imagination you know going along at a million miles an hour and and having good fun with it yeah um and yeah so talking kind of both of the questions that we've, we've answered you've answered already kind of feeds into this next one so when i was reading your author bio i was like whoa so you teach at the VNA. You've worked on Cam at Camden Market. You've been on Italian TV. You've been a coach for opera singers, and now you've written a book. And I just kind of wondered, like, how, like, how did you end up writing a book? At, like now, what, what, what led you? <laughs> um, I mean, three words: midlife crisis. I think <laughs> I, I kind of like hit forty and thought I've always wanted to write a book. I've always been a great reader. So I've just always, always read. My first degree at university was English literature. So it's always been in there. I've always enjoyed writing. And I've always thought, oh, I'd like to write a book one day. And friends have always said, oh, you should write a book one day. Um, and I never have. And I think it's just because I've had lots of other stuff going on, like all those things that you read out. And, and also, I think um, I'm essentially quite lazy I think and writing a book takes a lot of time and it's a huge amount of effort which I've just found out um, so that's why I never did it and I kind of hit 40 and thought right okay now's now's the time to write the book um, but I, I know myself quite well I know that I needed a bit of structure and some support so I, I enrolled at the Faber Academy on a six months writer write a novel course it was the best thing that I've ever done because uh, for that one day a week, it was every Tuesday, um, I used to go to Faber and Faber in uh, Bloomsbury. And it's a day where you're surrounded by another 14 different writers, people wanting to be writers. And it's a day where you could really think of yourself as a writer. So the other six days of the week, you know, I, I wasn't a writer. I was just Matson who worked in a museum or in the museum university. For that one day, you were a writer and you got to speak to other people who were writers and swap ideas and you'd read their stuff and they'd read your stuff. And it was wonderful. And, and plus, of course, you have to write because you're sharing what you're writing. So the only way that I ever really do anything is when I have to do it. If somebody's sort of standing behind me, forcing me to do it. And that's exactly what our, our wonderful teacher, Shelley, did do. You know, we had to come up with the goods. So I was very slow. Um, I was the, the really the, the tortoise of the, of, the, of the course. Everybody kind of zoomed ahead and wrote far quicker than I did. But um, at least it got me started. And by the end of the six months course, I was, I think I'd probably done about five or 6,000 words, which isn't a huge amount for five, six months. Um, but it was, it was, the important thing was just getting started. And, and yeah, so that, and, and once I'd started, I, and I really enjoyed writing, um, I just carried on, yeah. And I, I had a couple of really good writing buddies from the course, and we just used to meet up every couple of weeks and have a coffee. I think that's the secret to writing, having people to share it with, coffee and cake. <laughs> yeah. And so did, is that where you started on the book? Was it, did you kind of come up with the seeds during the, the, um, 
well the, the, I can remember really really clearly the first day of the course it's like first day at school where you turn up and everybody is trying to be really cool and you're all sitting down and who you're going to sit next to and we sat down and chatted and I thought there'd be three or four weeks where we just talk about writing and things like that really vague things and, and, and literally like in the first five minutes the teacher kind of went round to everybody and said right you what's your book Who are you what's your book you what's your book and of course I didn't have a book I had no idea what book I was going to write so I, I, I managed to blag uh, my way through that by pretending that I was doing a PhD at the time and, and turning my PhD into a novel and talking about it for a few minutes I think that's what an English literature degree allows you to do you can blag your way through life so it was very useful at that point. Um, and so everyone's, everyone was saying, oh yeah, that sounds really interesting, that what you're doing. And I got home and I thought, I don't want to write that book. And I'd had the idea of Evie in my mind for quite a few years, actually. I wanted to write something about home and about Yorkshire mm -hmm. and about characters that I knew, I suppose, yeah. Um, and so I thought, right, yeah, that's the book I'm going to write. And I started with the, the, very, first, the very first line. The first line of the book is the first line that I wrote and I kind of more or less went from beginning to end in the, the first oh, draft yeah. anyway. Yeah. That's quite unusual, really. So I hear, you know, to, to kind of get it out in one go in, that, in the order that it ends up being in. Yeah, well, I think that's because I'm so slow, though. I think, I think the, the, the slowness has an advantage there. So if you are quite slow, I can remember really clearly getting, getting to about halfway. Um, and halfway is where there's a kind of village fate. So the village fate was halfway for me. And I kind of like just whizzed from the beginning to the, the halfway point without planning or anything. I had these vague ideas in my head what was going to happen. And then I got to the halfway point and I knew what I wanted to happen from then to the end. But I suddenly thought, oh God, I'm going to have to plan a bit now because the second half of a novel is the really tricky half of the novel. So that's, that's the first point really that I, I planned. Yeah, then it was before then, it was just sitting down and and writing and enjoying writing. I used to love it. I absolutely, you know, I'd be waking up at five in the morning and doing a couple as before work and just and, and those two hours just felt like five minutes it was great oh, yeah I was, that was my next question actually if you had any sort of writing rituals but so it's, it was five o'clock in the morning before work was it yeah it was, yeah any any moment I could squeeze in around work really yeah um because I didn't really approach it as something that I hated once I'd got into it and, and and I really enjoyed it um I just I got really I mean I suppose I suppose writing a book is a bit like lockdown because now, you know, when we've just gone through lockdown, um, you can't go out, you can't meet anybody. Well, that's really what I was like for about 18 months, you know, and I, I didn't want to go out or meet anyone because I was just, I just wanted to do the book and write the book. Um, so I didn't mind spending two hours before work and three hours after work writing the book. Um, yeah, and, and I would, yeah, so my writing ritual in the morning, when I'm finishing off at night, I always try and write down a couple of ideas so that in, in that kind of morning sort of haze of not really knowing what my name is or anything, I can sit down whilst the tea is percolating through my tiny dinosaur brain. And I've got a few ideas that I can just use to spark me off and get going. And, and I always like to reread what I wrote the day before and just do a little bit of editing and then go back on. So actually those two hours before work in the morning, or sometimes it was an hour or whatever, um, I wouldn't get a huge amount of work done, but I just, I would kind of edit as I went along. Um, and then again, just write down a few ideas, a few notes for what I wanted to do after work. So, so that's, yeah, slow and steady, but kind of knowing, always just thinking, what do I want to happen? Why do I want it to happen? I suppose those are the key things, yeah. And, and having yeah. a cup of tea always to hand oh. I think that's the secret yeah. I was hoping you would have a tea I've got my tea here it's too hot Leanne I've got I've got I've got some water it's too <laughs> hot I tell you I tell you it's a good job I'm sitting down otherwise you'd, you'd see the tailor legs which aren't very good <laughs> so, yeah yeah it's really really hot <laughs> um and one of the other well you kind of touched on it as well so you were in you're now in London you were brought up in Yorkshire mm. Yorkshire features very like there's like loads of little, um, I can't think of what you'd say. Like, you know, the descriptions of like, you've got Betty's in there, you've got like people coming to visit and they're all excited by um, seeing the cows and all that kind of stuff. Um, but obviously now you live in London. So I guess, was it really, did you find all the references were just naturally coming to you because, because of where you were brought up or were you like deliberately trying to create a sense of 
the setting? Um, it, it, it came very, very naturally. So like I said, I mean, I, I was born and brought up um, in Yorkshire and, and get, I've still got loads of friends and family there so I go back and visit I mean I, I, I would go back when I was writing the book and spend uh, time with dad you know I'd be up there for weeks writing or long weekends um, so I was I actually did a lot of the writing whilst I was up there as well and it's, it's a kind of yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a love letter to Yorkshire I think it's, it's, it's strange when I was when I was little when I was growing up um, I, we used to come to London and get all right uh, with my family quite a bit and go to the museums and the shops and I'd go off to Leeds and Manchester and when I was that young age I think like most young people I was desperate to get to uh, like a big cosmopolitan urban city just like really cool I can remember like going to Manchester on my own you know across the Pennines and thinking wow it's like the center of the universe and coming down to London was like another world as well because um, I grew up in a very small village in the countryside um, and I was kind of like really wanted to almost get away as soon as I could which I you know I, I went to university etc but now it's completely the opposite I'm kind of I love going back and just um, I feel a different person when I'm back there actually I've just been back doing a book tour for a couple of weeks and it's it's just been bliss I've just loved it I've you know just become a different person and my sleep work goes really well I can sleep and you know I'm quite a chatterbox anyway but I go into sort of chatterbox overdrive whenever I'm back surrounded by other Yorkshire chatterboxes um so yeah I, I want it to be a love letter to Yorkshire and I want Yorkshire to be almost like a character in the book I want you to get a real sense of of Yorkshire or oh, actually Yorkshire obviously Yorkshire is very important but um almost I suppose it's, it's a feeling that anybody who's grown up in the countryside or even in you know a small suburban setting will understand i think to some point this this extent of oh you can see bright lights just over the hill what's going on there when you when you're young and curious you're desperate to have a look and it's that kind of thing that i wanted to bring yeah yes you definitely get that but i felt completely like i'm, I'm from a smaller rural place as well um and it very much that that is exactly what i did as soon as i could yeah. went to london yeah <laughs> and now i've moved back out again yeah yeah um and the 60s that was another thing that you know what made you set it there because i'm i've always been kind of fascinated by the 60s and 70s i was born in the late 80s and there was all this the idea of like all the freedom and all the culture of the time and yeah i i mean i could see why it's kind of a pull and, and, and perhaps in the way that York is almost a setting, Yorkshire the setting, you know, it's very much a, a character, sorry. It feels like the 60s are as well. Um, but I guess, yeah, what, what was it that made you go, ah, oh, it needs I, to be set then? I think because the 60s, the 60s have the such strong cultural resonance, you know, to, to anybody across the world, you say the 60s. And I mean, you say the 60s to anybody in the world and they think of, of Britain, really, in the UK and what, what, what we did. I mean, and, you know, the things like the Beatles, the music, the fashion. I mean, we had a, a, a big Mary Quant exhibition at the v &A recently, you know, and it's just incre this in, in, incredible sense of... Um, it's like the big bang moment where everything starts and it was so exciting um, but of course it wasn't that exciting and it didn't step going bang on January the 1st 1960 so I, I wanted something so that you can, can you can smell you know what we all know what the 60s are and we can as a reader you can kind of smell the 60s come in like you can sense this big bang moment but a lot of the people in the book particularly in the first part of the book they're they're still living in the 1950s and they're completely unaware of what's going to happen um, so that's that's really why I chose 1962, yeah, because because the the sick what comes after that is just uh, fantastic and really strong, and and everybody can relate to it, and everybody knows something about it. We don't, you know, I'm I wasn't around in the 60s either, but you kind of you don't need to be around in the 60s to to know about the 60s and and appreciate the 60s and love the 60s, really, yeah. But then I think it's fascinating because it's we we look back 
uh, we look back on the 60s now. And of course, we, we obviously to us, it's like, yeah, it's the 60s. We know what's going to happen. But I think in, to, to people living in 1960 or 1961, they had no idea what was going to come. And, and Evie in this very small Yorkshire village in 1962, she's got no idea either. And then you just, it just gradually, like I said, these whiffs of the 60s start coming and then... Just like I suppose she's got no idea what adulthood is going to be. And then, you know, as she grows throughout the book, she gets a, a stronger sense of what that might entail as well. Yeah, I love the, the, four, the four boys from Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, we know who they are. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you were saying with the, the V&A then, so do you, you work for the V&A, so I guess some of that, cultural research you could do through through your work or it's just stuff that you already know no absolutely i mean the the vna we've got the the national art library which is just the best resource ever for a novelist i think because it's as well as all the books that are there um it's just it's just rammed full of lots of magazines and the, for me magazines are fantastic because they they give a real sense of what life how life was lived I think. And so I, I spent my, my, pretty much all my research was flicking through old country lives and melody makers and vogues and, you know, all of these things. Um, and not so much for the articles, but for the, um, for the adverts, and, you know, because it's from the adverts that you get a real sense of what people wanted, what they wanted to buy, what their dreams were, what they were scared of, you know, what they smelt like, you know, like what they dressed like. And so, yeah, it was fantastic. I used to love just sitting there for hours. It was quite, I, I'd quite happily just go and sit in, a, in an archive and go through old magazines you know, day after day after day, which is just as well for a novelist because that's, that's a really effective way of doing research, I think, yeah. Yeah, that sounds really fun. It's really good fun. And there's a fantastic cafe as well. So even better, it's like win-win, yeah. yeah. So bog off, buy one, <laughs> get one free, yeah. Library and cafe. Yeah, fab. Um, and the book has obviously uh, been chosen for Joe Wiley's book club on Radio 2. That's so exciting. How, yeah, when did you hear about that? And God, it was really exciting, yeah. So that was a few weeks ago, and Chris, who's my editor at Scribner, phoned me. And, um, and normally he just emails or texts. And I thought, oh my God, something terrible has happened, what's happened? <laughs> and he was just so, you could tell in his voice, he was so happy. And, and he told me straight away, you know, he didn't even try and sort of like, you know, make a joke or anything, because he was just like desperate to get it out of there. And then, and I just kept saying, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, that's fantastic. Um, because it is, you know, such an, an amazing thing. You know, this is my first novel, I was just so happy, really. And it's great because it means that, you know, that there's a lot of, people who have obviously read the book and, and liked the book in order for it to get on the Radio 2 book list, um, which as a, you know, as a first time novelist and still feeling really insecure about these things, you know, I've, I've normally sort of writing more academic, serious stuff. So um, if it, it was, it was a, it's a great feeling. Yeah. Cause that, that horrible kind of imposter feeling that I, maybe a lot of us have when we try something new. Um, at that moment, it just begun to lift a little bit. And I thought, oh, well, actually, you know, maybe I, I've not wasted three years of my life after all. Yeah. But yeah, so it's really exciting. I'm very excited about talk, talking to Joe Wiley as well. I'm going to have to, I'm, ter I'm terrified about my terrible taste in music. So I'm going to have to go and like try and up my music, team, I think. So I was, I was talking to somebody in a Scarborough bookshop in Waterstones and, and sharing like my worries about this. And they said, just say Bowie. You can't go wrong. Just say Bowie. You can't. Actually, you really can't go wrong. Oh, well, there you go. Well, and I've got, here we go. There's my, there's my homework for those. Oh, that love it. Yeah. So, yeah, which, which is true. That's, that's my homework for the set research for the second book. So the second book is, is Evie again, but set in 1972. So I'm listening to lots of good music from 1972. But, yeah. Oh, very exciting. Yeah, I was going to come on to that. But, so it is another Evie, another Evie book. Yeah. It? When, when, I, when, I, when I sort of thought of the story originally years ago, um, I kind of saw it as three books. So one is 1962, one 1972, and one 1982, three, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, because I, I'm, like I said, I'm interested in, in exploring this idea of what, what decades are and what makes them a decade and all of that. 
and also just dropping in on somebody's life every 10 years and just see what's happened yeah you know i'm desperate to get back to evie i'm, I'm actually halfway through chapter three and i started writing the second book i think like april or something like that and there'd been a, quite a gap between you know like proper writing because i'd just been doing editing and I was a, a bit worried, to be honest. I thought, oh, God, you know, can I, can I get Evie's voice? You know, so I sat down at the, at the keyboard and it just came and it was just, you know, I really enjoyed it. It was, I don't know, it's like a weird feeling. It was like something like came and went through my fingers and it wasn't me. It was, yeah. So that was good anyway. And so I'm feeling happy with my, my two and a half chapters that I've done so far. So you started during lockdown then? I started doing lock you're in lockdown yeah yeah which I haven't done very much at all partly because I am so slow like I've said but partly I think because lockdown is quite it's quite been a hard time for everybody and it's weird because writers like I said earlier we we kind of are on lockdown pretty much all of our writing lives it's like being on lockdown but when the whole world is on lockdown with you it feels weird and and I, I'm speaking to other friends who are writers. None of us have been able to be that productive and that efficient because there's just been so much going on. So, yeah, I mean, everybody's saying, oh, lockdown must be great for you. Da, da, da. Um, and it's been hard, I think, for everybody for lots of reasons. Yeah, yeah but yeah. And um, now I'm not doing any writing at all. Now I'm just doing some interviews and, and book PR and, and going yeah. in, in booksellers, which is very exciting, actually, yeah. Yeah, I've seen you with your, your cow mask doing um, tours of bookshops. Exactly. I was just looking to see if I could see it, but I think it's near the front door. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. How's that been? You've been able to go in and, and sign copies and, and meet booksellers and stuff? Yeah, ex exactly. So I haven't been, um, there's no events at all. So it's just me. I mean, obviously, we speak to the bookshop beforehand, give them some notice. And it's really just me in the corner of the room signing a few copies of the book and chatting to the bookseller, you know, all wearing my mask and everybody's very socially distant. And it's been lovely, actually. It's been great to, yeah, to speak to, to the booksellers. Um, most of them have read the book and they're really happy to talk about the book, which is great. Um, you know, I, I kind of envisage myself just nipping in for a minute, signing and then running out again. But it hasn't been like that at all. Everybody wants to chat and talk about Evie. And everybody says, oh, what happens next? You are doing another one, aren't you? So there's this like massive pressure even from the booksellers now. Yeah. But yeah, but it does feel like it obviously it ends in a really nice way for for the book you're like oh, okay everything's kind of come together and this it's all yeah i'm glad she's doing what she's doing but without you know telling anyone how it ends <laughs> but yeah it, it you do want to find out more what, what's going to come next so so when we come back to her what she'll be about, about 25 26 then, yeah she? yeah she'll be sort of 26 and a half ish yeah so there'll be there'll be other things that she she wants to think about i was just thinking about me what what was i like 26 and a half um, you know, we've got other, other, I mean, it, you, at that age, you, you kind of like still, you think, oh, I'm getting old, but you still, you still kind of don't ever think you ever really are going to get old. And you still, when you're that age, you still think you are, should I do this? Or should I do that? Or should I do that? So you've still got this sort of like vast array of choices, but you know, that you feel the pressure that you, you, that you probably didn't have when you were 16 and a half, but um, yeah. I think you've, you've still got a big selection of stuff. So, I mean, and then, then all the personal stuff as well. I'm going to have some fun with her, I think, in this book, yeah. And, yeah, I, it was just so funny. Like, from the first chapter, you get a real sense <laughs> of the humour that's going to come like, with what happens at the end of that first chapter. And I was really like, what? And read it aloud because I was sort of, <laughs> what's happened? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it's, it's so, so funny, really, really hilarious. And the fact that you sort of saying, you know, you mainly do academic writing and to get into this different kind of headspace, um, so you must have a very, a very good sense of humour. I, you know, I just loved writing this because you don't have to bother with any references. You don't have to send it off to be peer reviewed. I mean, it's just wonderful. You can just make things up. I've just enjoyed it. I've had such a good time writing. And it's, I mean, honestly, I really, really, really have just loved doing it. So, um, I, yeah, I can't wait to get back writing again. Yeah. The, the, the really strange thing is I get quite a lot of people messaging me on Twitter and Instagram and they say things like, I never laugh out loud at books, but your book makes me laugh out loud, which is, you know, just makes me feel really, really, really pleased because 
we all need to have a bit of a laugh at the moment, I think. It's been a tough time. And if Evie and the book can make people smile, make people laugh. Um, I've, I've had people um, sort of texting and saying, oh yeah, you know, this my, my, you know, I was reading this, you know, quietly on the sofa and my husband was saying, yeah, what are you laughing at? You've got to read it out. And so, you know, I had to read it out and then he was laughing and uh, so it's just, it's it's kind of like almost like a shared shared moments of laughter, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. that's great. No, it's totally like joyful. Like the whole feel of it is really uplifting and happy. And even when there's like some of the more serious and um, you know those parts of the book, that it's still kind of it's carried through with this really like loving kind of joyous feeling. It's, it's yeah, fab. Lovely. Thank you. That's, that's exactly what I was aiming for, actually. And I, I wanted, I mean, I want, there's some, that's some em, emotional um, sort of depth and tenderness there and sort of like these heart, heartwarming and heartbreaking moments as well. I mean, and, and I kind of obviously want to make people laugh, but I, I want to make them cry a little bit as well. And so people have been saying, oh, I've been crying at this scene. And I'm like, yeah, I want you to cry. <laughs> Um, and I, th I think that's the kind of books that I like, actually. They're the ones where they're, um, they're, they're, they're sort of saying something, you know, tender and emotional and sort of heartwarming, um, but hopefully not in a, at least the ones that I really enjoy, not in a really kind of like pretentious, um, sort of literary way with a, with a capital L, saying like, look at me, look at, you know, look at me, I'm being literary now. Um, I think the, lots of the writing that I really enjoy reading um, is extremely good. People like Kate Atkinson, who can absolutely just nail emotions and say really clever things, really touching things. But in, but the, the, I mean, the lightness is, um, or the lightness in the in, in in how she writes because it's there's a lot of humor in in her work and other people like her. you probably maybe don't even i don't know maybe you don't notice the the emotion as much or something i'm not explaining myself very well there but no i know what you mean yeah, yeah. because it's yes it has that element of lightness as you say and yeah. and it can be uh, perhaps only in a few words this it's conveyed in a, a more simpler way yeah, and, but it, and it kind of hits home. It really hits yeah. home. I, and, and that's the kind of writing that I love, where it's not kind of laboured. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's kind of what I want Evie to be. I wanted it to be really funny, but to be saying, you know, quite a few sort of serious things as well. But but um, without people going like, oh my God, like, I don't want you to get to the end of the book and feel like you deserve like a badge for reading it. Like, you know, I, I survived, you know, I got to the end or something like, oh, can you send me my certificate now, please? I want people to really enjoy it as well as get something else from it, yeah. Yeah. And then um, the cover is really lovely and eye-catching. And I've seen your, like, your yellow, um, very 60s yellow, like, tote bags and, and everything as well. Did you have any say in the cover or? The cover, I mean, I mean, the cover is brilliant. I love the cover so much. And there's a, there is a funny story about the cover. So the first draft of the, of the cover was done last October, I think, around about the time of the Frankfurt Book Festival. And I was, I was up in Yorkshire at the time visiting friends. And Chris, my editor at Scribner, phoned me and said, um, Matt, I'm going to send you the, our first draft of the cover. Um, it's really just the first draft. I don't want you to be upset if you see it and you don't like it. We can change it, don't worry. It's just something that we have to do just to get into the Frankfurt Book Fair um, brochure. So I was expecting something absolutely terrible because he'd phoned me <laughs> and I'd set up. I thought, oh God, it's gonna be awful. And he sent, he sent something through. And to be honest, I loved it. It's completely different to that. So it's completely different to that. And the, 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 the original one was, this extremely like, tasteful Scandinavian kind of Conranish kind of designer. I could see it up in a poster on my wall and all kind of like muted pastel colors. And I thought, oh God, this is beautiful. You know, I can't wait. I want this on my wall. It's really lovely. And I lived that for about three or four months. And then um, I was at the cinema with, with a friend, I think January this year. And Chris sent through an email saying, here's the final design. And I was expecting like that design, but just a little bit tweaked. And I opened the email to see, to see that more or less. 
Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, what's happened to my really lovely, beautiful, tasteful Scandium design? Yeah. Um, and it, it took about 30 seconds. But after 30 seconds, both me and my friend, Emily, we just said, God, no, absolutely, this, this, this is the cover because it just captures the, the, the energy and the nostalgia and the humor. It's just, and the, you know, the country and the, you know, the font and everything. It's just, it's just perfect. In fact, you know, they, they've done such a brilliant job with everything, with all aspects of the book. They've been brilliant, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, it's really eye-catching. I love it. And very, yeah, it's very 60s, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. When I walk into book jobs, I get, and I say like, hello, I've come to do some signings. I'm Matson Taylor. And they go, oh yeah, you're the one with the cows on the cover. <laughs> I'm, I'm forever going to be the the writer with the cows on the cover. Yeah, yeah. Wonder what'll be on the, the cover of the next one. Yeah, well, I'm not saying I can't say whether there'll be cows or not. Yeah, <laughs> better write it first. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Really, is there anything else you want readers to know? Or um, well, I, I, gosh, I don't know now. Um, I, I I just really want people to 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 read it and love it and enjoy it actually. And I I think that's the thing. It's um. I hope it's a, a, a really good, fun read um, that will, yeah, bring a bit of joy into people's lives. And yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, a, there's a kind of online community growing already where people are becoming quite obsessive about Evie, and, which is lovely for me as a writer. It's, it's really strange, actually, because it's kind of for three years, it's been pretty much just me and Evie, and then maybe with my editor and my, my lovely agent, Alice. Um, and then suddenly she's, it feels like she's kind of like run off and there's all these other people who are, who are kind of like, you know, like sat there having a drink with Evie and it's like, no, you know, she's mine, come back. And everybody's taken ownership of her. It's really strange. But lovely. I haven't really thought of that before, but that, but yeah, I guess it must feel really like something very personal has just gone out into the world and started a life of its own. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's lovely though, because it's not even just Evie. So people are having these conversations online and they're saying like, oh yeah, and I really love Mrs. Scott Pym. She's so fantastic. I'd really love a grandma like her. And like, oh, Mrs. Switherbank, she's my favourite. So they're, they're talking about the characters and, and comparing different traits of them, which is great. I mean, it makes me feel really, really happy because I, I suppose I've done my job in, in sort of giving people fully rounded, fun characters, yeah. Yeah, even the bad ones are fun, I think. Even the baddies are fun, yeah. Yeah, no, they are. Yeah, you, you, like the pantomime. Yeah. Thing, you love to hate. And <laughs> the, I mean, I think the, the, the kind of the flashbacks, the interludes, so they're throughout the book to give, I think, because the, the, the book is mainly Evie's story in Evie's, in Evie's voice, it's first person. But throughout the book, there are these tiny interludes um, that just gradually build to give you a, a more fully rounded knowledge of Evie's parents, for example, and Evie's lovely next door neighbor, Mrs. Scott Pym. Um, and yeah, I think those, those are the, those are the, I mean, I'm not gonna say that those are the parts that I'm most proud of, but they're, they're the bits that I, I really like because they're the kind of the, the tender, um, that in a way they were the hardest parts to write because they were the parts that, that, almost didn't come from somebody else the Evie part was me it was like Evie must have just come in one ear or something and sat in my brain and was just, but the, the 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 interludes of the part that I sat down and I feel like you know I, I kind of wrote those myself yeah I didn't get any help from Evie with those bits yeah so I hope people enjoy those yeah no the, the whole thing was fantastic absolutely loved it oh thank really, you really funny Brilliant. and um as I said yeah I definitely think it's like the perfect book to read at the moment when everyone's just a little bit mm. and it's a nice time to go back to isn't it like the 60s and before coronavirus <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah no oh, it's fantastic and um yeah hopefully maybe one day you'll be able to come down and or come up actually if you're in london come up to tring visit the i'd bookshop. love to come to the bookshop yeah i'd love to come up to the tring bookshop and uh, sign some books and just say hello to everyone there it'd be fantastic actually yeah no i definitely will yeah Right. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak to me today. Thank you very much for inviting me. That's really nice of you. It's been lovely speaking to you, Leanne. 
Massive thanks to Leanne and to Matson for that wonderful interview. So, uh, The Miseducation of Evie Epworth is available in our bookshop. Give us a call on 01442 827 653. All the other purchase blurb is available in the text below this video. Thank you so much. We've got so many more interviews to come, and uh, we'll see you very soon.